special presentation of LOBF with archaeologists Dr. Lawrence Garrity and Dr. Doug Clark, Excavating the Bible. Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, What Archaeology Can Teach Us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions of Middle Eastern archaeology to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark, director of the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University in Riverside, California. And along with my co-host, Dr. Larry Garrity, also from La Sierra, also longtime archaeologist. We are inviting our guest, um, also from La Sierra <laughs> University, Dr. Kent Bramlett, who is Assistant Professor of Archaeology and uh, the History of Antiquity, to talk about the practice of archaeology, the process of archaeology, mm -hmm. and why that's important, and why that would be important for those of us who do it and then present our results and our findings to the public. So we have among us a lot of archaeological experience. Larry, if you could count back to the beginning. <laughs> what was the first year you did archaeology back in? It was 1968, 68. starting at Gezer. Mm -hmm. And then moving to Hespan. Mm -hmm. so, and, and I began in 1973, and Kent in 1994. Mm -hmm. um, so if you total those years, there are a significant number, there's a, a significant number of years of uh, archaeological work. Right. And we've learned a few things, we think, right. along the way. The importance of doing quality work. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we think about our mentor, Larry, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Horn, Dr. Mm -hmm. Siegfried Horn, and how important it was to be precise, right. and some of the chief archaeologists we've worked with, mm -hmm. how important it's been to be precise and careful. Mm -hmm. Why is that the case? Why is that the case generally? And why is that the case when we're doing archaeology we call biblical archaeology? Why is it important? Well, you know, in a way, we ought to be able to put back everything that we've discovered just the way we found it. And in order to do that, you have to have really accurate records, photographic records, measurement records, and so forth. So um, preciseness and accuracy help to achieve that. And our, I would say our conclusions are only as good as our methodologies. That's true. Yeah. We often go back to early excavations and we're sometimes unsure when a building even dates to because uh, the methodologies just weren't right. That, very that tight. That sounds kind of like an academic. I mean, the process may be more important than the outcome in a sense. <clears throat> and so doing it right, what does doing it right mean in the archaeological world? Now you can go back to the 60s mm -hmm. and we think we followed best practices. In a sense, that's what we're talking about, right. best yeah. practices, mm -hmm. in order to come up with the most responsible outcomes. Um, what would the best practices consist of? We're going to look at some of those with some slides uh, for this particular mm -hmm. program. But what sorts of general best practices were destructive of the material? We can't put it back. Mm -hmm. So what are the best practices to keep it? Preserved? Well, one of them is not to dig everything at the site. You purposely want to leave a portion undug by us because we know that later people coming along will have newer methods and newer abilities to interpret it, and they can check what we've done. Yeah. Now, you've been at it for a long time, Larry. Have you seen some technology <laughs> changes over Definitely, time? Definitely, yes. <laughs> uh, you, you gentlemen who were just there this summer uh, have been employing some new technology that's very exciting. So yes, there are changes. Right. Yeah. Remember when we first started, we had to get measuring tapes out there and use the theodolites, and it was all very, uh, you know, uh, complex but simple in some ways. Right. But uh, now. One instrument can tell you exactly where you are on the face of the earth. <laughs> that was uh, new. It was a lot more manual. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> what other kinds of uh, kind of general, I don't know if practices is the right word, but mm. in general, why do we have to do quality work and what mm. kinds of quality work? We try to record everything we, we possibly can. Even data that we might not think is important now, no. mm -hmm. but in a, at a future time, there'll be a lot of information to be gleaned from some of those aspects which we might think are less important now. But of course we can't go back, we've already mentioned right. the difficulty there, um, to reaccess what's been excavated. And so we just try to record 
everything. And that's where some of the new technology that you right. re mm -hmm. uh, referred to comes in. It's an attempt for this sort of total uh, recording procedure. Mm -hmm. Now, in the early days, okay, and I'm looking at Larry <laughs> when, I, when I say I in the why. early days. I, I don't know. In the early days, recording, in fact, if one goes to museums, mm -hmm. and some museums have the early notebooks mm -hmm. of archaeologists back mm -hmm. into the 19th century, right. um, and it's basically descriptions, what I saw. Right. Right. Um, when we started at Hespan, mm -hmm. um, tell That's Hespan. the way it was, 1968. It was. We it each was. were given a little book, and we were just told, record whatever you do measure whatever you can. There was no specific way to do it. We each developed our own way. That was just the first season. Mm -hmm. And then we developed a common system right. driven by computers, right? right, right. Uh, in fact, I think uh, the project was one of the early ones to computerize. Mm -hmm. And in the process, you were driven to the need to be precise right. and to right. have specific measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't guess at this, you've got right. specific ones. And then, of course, you can do with, uh, with those data all kinds of creative right. statistical sorts right. of things. Mm -hmm. And publishing <coughs> accurately and quickly what we have found was something that we learned from our mentor. He said, even if it's not always right and even if there's mistakes, it's important to get it out there so that people can judge your conclusions based on the methods and the accuracy of what you've done. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons for doing what best practices, mm -hmm. following best practices, mm -hmm. would be because others are looking over our shoulder all the time. We actually are, are sort of accredited mm -hmm. by the American Schools of Oriental Research. Mm -hmm. And um, what we process and how we process mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. then will be judged by people who also are active and mm -hmm. Who's, uh, and our findings will be judged mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. by how well we do And we work. want our, our uh, publications to be credible. Right. We want people to be able to trust in, our, in how we do the archaeology, that our conclusions are based on legitimate um, facts that right. we right. excavate. So in, in the world of biblical archaeology, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll come back to this, but in the world of biblical archaeology, doing it well, doing our archaeology well, at least gives us that credibility, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. And then. Um, when we're doing the biblical study, we do that carefully too. And as we're comparing, we are uh, systematic, we're careful uh, in, in that approach too, mm -hmm. so that people can look over our shoulder at any time and say, we're just following how they're doing it. It mm -hmm. makes sense, it's logical. The outcome should be trustworthy because of the process. Some people don't realize it, but the Bible needs interpretation too. You know, we talk about a straightforward reading, but often we have to interpret what those words mean in the context, a cultural context, even in which they were written, and of course, historical context. So both archaeology, the evidence that we get there, and the readings of scripture need interpretation. And of course, as biblical archaeologists, we're hoping that the two will yes. match yeah. and be complementary. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least inform each other, right. Right. because we know they right. don't always right. match, right. but that they will inform each other and maybe even raise some new questions mm -hmm. for our research, mm -hmm. whether it's archaeological or biblical, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that actually might open some new doors yeah. and surprise us mm -hmm. with uh, really important information. We learned right off the bat, didn't we, at Heshbon, that, that uh, because we were expecting to find one thing, we couldn't find it, we had to come to terms with uh, our findings in relationship to what we thought Scripture said. Right, right. And we, and we come to our work, everybody comes to their mm -hmm. work with preconceived ideas. Sure. And I think what anthropologists are calling a preferred past, mm -hmm. uh, a preferred interpretation. Mm -hmm. And doing archaeology well may actually force us to rethink those preferences. Mm -hmm. And uh, we might need to learn something new. I mean, mm -hmm. we're academics, so mm -hmm. not a bad idea. And as you say, we've been at this for a while, and I'm thinking about the history of archaeological work in the Middle East that was written at the 100th anniversary of uh, the professional organization we belong to. And we don't want to brag here particularly, but in there we're credited with introducing new methods and new ways of doing things, and uh, with some, some important innovations that now most people in the, in the field follow. All right, all right. Let's take a look at some of the slides. And um, uh, we're going to build on a definition of archaeology that we've used before. Mm -hmm. And we keep coming back to it primarily because of this emphasis on systematic 
And this is the part that, the, sort of the popular vision of archaeology, especially the Indiana Jones <laughs> types, they, they would stumble at this word, not right, get any right. further. But if we think about recovery and analysis, interpretation and preservation, uh, those are the steps we want to look at in mm -hmm. this particular edition of Excavating the Bible. And if we're talking about biblical archaeology, we do the same work, the same quality of work, but now we do it in the context of biblical times and places, mm -hmm. and people and concerns and so on, and in the process hope to illuminate the biblical world mm -hmm. a bit better so that maybe we will understand the passages mm -hmm. better. Right. So we'll just go through each of those systematic parts, and systematic is on each of these slides, so <laughs> kind of remind us that, uh, that we have to do this well, and it has to be repeatable. One has to be able to say, if you in, encounter the same kind of situation, you're going to do it the same way so that you get uh, trustworthy uh, results. Mm -hmm. Oh, Larry, <laughs> this takes us back. In fact, I think you have some tools uh, in front of you. We me. do. We have a couple of things that are very important that we always start with. One is a trowel. And we like to say Marshalltown trowels, that specific kind of trowel is, uh, we, th is we think, the best. And uh, the thing that's missing here is a little pick. Uh, you see it on the slide there. Mm -hmm. um, and so with a, with a pick and with the trowel are the two things. And of course, you always have to have a brush to keep, uh, keep things clean and so you're not digging blind. Yeah. So, so even with sophisticated things, even like some we see on the table here and we'll look at later, <laughs> right. we still depend on, on the old standby. The, the trowel <laughs> becomes an extension of the hand. And it's amazing how sensitive you, could, you feel the changes in the That's soil, right. you know, the hardness of the soil or the composition. Mm -hmm. It's and sort of like your teeth, isn't it? When you're biting something, you can tell. It's a good and analogy. When you've, when you've got something in your hand like this, just mm -hmm. as you say, it's an extension of yourself. Yeah. And, and it, is, it does sensitize one to changes. Right. And it's these small changes that are part of systematic mm -hmm. and doing mm -hmm. this carefully. Mm -hmm. And so we have the pick and the trowel. People develop this rhythm. Mm -hmm. we, for newcomers, we always do this so that they get an <laughs> idea of what it feels like. And then you can detect changes, mm -hmm. which then tell us something new has come. And uh -huh. we need to uh, think about how to date it and do all kinds of analysis on so it. So here are volunteers practicing that technique, aren't they? Yep. <laughs> this is the beginning of the season where right, we line up right. and, and learn the pick and trowel technique. And then putting it to use in uh, tight quarters because you're not only and forever on the top of the surface, you're going to get down to things. Mm -hmm. And here are a couple of uh, volunteers. One of them, your cousin, yeah. Larry, uh, mm -hmm. Carolyn on the right, and then Larry Murin from Canada, um, excavating around a small, fragile wall line. And the way the soil, what is it, Kent, as we look at, is it stratigraphy, the word that we're looking for? That yeah. The way these different uh, elements interact with each other and that helps us understand which came first mm -hmm. and then we can talk about dating them and so on mm -hmm. in the process. Talk to us about this one, Kent. This was from uh, a couple years ago. Yeah, this was an interesting find. Um, as we were excavating, we, f we came down on the top of a, well, it looked like a jar of some kind, but as we excavated further, we realized this was a large storage jar and it had actually been buried in the floor partially buried, or set into the floor of this, this house, um, kind of like a pantry. And we excavated, um, we excavated uh, both of these, and they're actually um, very different. It was, uh, the, the, it was an interesting question about their date, because one appears to be a little earlier than the other. But we do know from ethnographic uh, comparisons that these large storage jars last a long, long time. time. Mm -hmm. So maybe they expanded and added a second one. A bit later. And these could be 150 years apart, at least yeah, yeah. as you look at it. By looking at the forms. Yeah, typically yes. looking at the form. People so. often ask what that uh, stick is doing in there with the <laughs> white and the black uh, you know, stripes. So that's mm -hmm. a meter stick, isn't it, there for scale so that we know uh, mm -hmm. what, how big Another they part of the systematic, another mm -hmm. part about doing it carefully so that we can always come back and say, well, we know exactly mm -hmm. how wide this mm -hmm. is. We know how high it is because we've got the scale. Mm -hmm to work from. Another thing, in one of these jars was found um, some, uh, some skulls, mm. some blind mole rat skulls mm. that had fallen in, enjoyed a feast for a while, couldn't get out, and in the process died. Mm -hmm. uh, so it says something about the competition for, for resources. For good, for food and for <laughs> right. resources, exactly. Now, 
What is this about? Now, Larry, I want you to talk about this because it's in these things that we find lots of small artifacts. That's true. We uh, dump all the dirt that we excavate into these sifts, uh, a sieve, and shake it, uh, and then all the dirt falls through, uh, leaving the pottery and the objects and the stones and anything that's too big to go through the sift. And so we try, through this method, to make sure that uh, nothing escapes our attention. Including very small inscriptions mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Or, or, or seal impressions right. and so on. Right, right. Um, and a lot of excavations only sift part of their, their material. Yeah. We, yeah. we typically we everything. sift everything. Yeah. Right, right, right. right. Okay, analysis. We've talked about the practice. Now um, moving to analysis. Kent, this is an older photo, and I don't know if you are. Yes, you are. A little I see further down you. the line. I see you right down here. Yeah. Um, Dr. Larry Herr and his wife Denise. Uh, Larry Herr is the uh, ceramics uh, analyst, um, mm -hmm. and you now do that for the excavation. What is he doing with all of these broken pieces of pottery on the table? Well, he's, we say we, that we read the pottery. Um, in a sense, that's true. We look at the, the types of um, shapes that we find. The, mm -hmm. There's a number of things about pottery that you look at, the shape, the, the surface treatment, and so on. But we determine the date of the different pieces. And from this, we can date the structures that we're ex excavating, or the layers of, of Earth. And that's our primary way of finding mm -hmm. Uh, the, the time period. So, so that way, again, systematically, we're putting a time frame to what we find. Mm -hmm. And then if we're comparing anything biblically, we mm -hmm. have to think about that same, same time frame. Mm -hmm. Again, systematically looking at both uh, sources of information mm -hmm. and trying to learn from both of them mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, interpretation. Nothing is without interpretation. Everything is interpreted. We interpret everything. Um, this is uh, one of our uh, professionals, uh, one of our core staff, uh, Monique Vincent, holding what, Kent? Well, it's a small scarab seal, and it has a design. Uh, uh, you can see there's a person of uh, some sort of etched almost into. almost see here. Yeah, there's the head, and here's the uh, body here. Right, sometimes these have writing on them, or hieroglyphs. Uh, this one doesn't. But we have found those before as well. Mm -hmm. But these are very important because we can look at the style of them, even if they don't have writing. We can determine something about their time period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we do have lots of biblical connections from inscriptions that are we found. Do. Mm -hmm. Again, doing this carefully and systematically, mm -hmm. we'll actually have a lot more information mm -hmm. to use mm -hmm. as we start thinking about uh, the Bible. One part of archaeology that we don't always think about is preservation. Um, storing things, we, we know red crates uh, very well. I don't know how many of these we've been through, maybe a 1, thousand, fifteen hundred of these. Uh, what are in those crates behind you there? Well, th there are all kinds of things. Um, some are artifacts, some are materials that we use on our excavation, um, but we have these things stacked high. Some of them are bones. Uh, mm -hmm. We keep the bones, especially animal bones and we analyze those too. So these store pretty much everything that we excavate. What are these people doing, Ken? <laughs> well, part of the um, process we go through, we need to record everything. And sometimes an artist's eye is the best way to do that. Uh, sometimes with a camera, but other times the drawing is really the best way to get at it. So these are uh, two of our, our collaborating artists, and they are drawing the artifacts that we've found. Both of them happen to come from Andrews University Art Department, don't they? Where yeah. the Hespan dig right. uh, gotcha. still has its roots, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So Stephanie Elkins Bates on mm -hmm. the left and Rhonda Root, both of whom produce beautiful uh, artistry for our publications. And as you say, they can sometimes see mm -hmm. through an artist's eye what we can't, mm -hmm. what those of us not gifted in the same way mm -hmm. can see. And for and reconstructions, helpful. artistic reconstructions, it's, right. it's imperative. It it is, it is, it is. From this picture, we know that you have to be agile to be a photographer. Right. Don't you? <laughs> and everything is photographed. Uh, right. And Jillian Logie here from uh, Calgary, Alberta, is uh, not only agile, she's an excellent <laughs> photographer. Yeah. And 
again, systematic, careful, carefully done, mm -hmm. adds credibility to our work. Mm -hmm. So when we put all of these things together, the activities as well as the tools and the practices, uh, then one can test and assess uh, a quality of work. This is how we used to do it, um, sitting on top of these five meter tall ladders, sometimes in a stiff breeze, uh, taking photographs. We've, um, Would that be King Doug on his th throne? Well, this, is, this, is, this is Doug <laughs> sitting on top of the ladder. Um, and you can see how we used to do it. And that's an old camera, too. Um, but we have graduated from mm. this. We don't use the ladder anymore. And so we'll talk about that. Um, but first of all, some of the technology, we used to record notes, yep. and then we got mm. sophisticated so that we recorded notes that fit computer language, right. and then we got to the computers themselves. Kent, what do we have here in front of us? This is our principal recording instrument right here. The big one is, is good for reference. We use this to look at our, our previous data and maps and plans and things like that. Um, but in each square, the square supervisor, so that's the person that's leading uh, the excavation in the five by five meter uh, area enters the data, all of the information we used to write down on these <laughs> these papers, uh, into this um, iPod. We have a specially programmed uh, database system. You can enter it from a lot of drop-down lists, and it's quite efficient. And it's not only efficient, it's accurate because you don't have to invent the terms. Right. Yeah. It's not uh, somebody who's acquainted with something that looks like this from one part of the world. This is all the same, these are all the same terms. Mm -hmm. And so you punch that in and so our consistency mm -hmm. improves considerably. It does. So, okay, and then we have both of them here, um, all of them geared. Kent, I think this is you uh, on the left here. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, um, Using the, I'm putting in a stake, but we're going to uh, locate points according to our uh, GPS uh, coordinates. So this is where we've moved a little bit right. beyond the right. old, old um, no more the eye level, the level. Exactly. Right. Right. And we can get down to a, a centimeter or two in precision on the XYZ coordinates. Um, and this is very important for recording fine spots of, uh, of objects and right. the whole plants. Because we can actually reconstruct pretty much the whole site yeah. uh, in terms of three dimensions mm -hmm. uh, and p basically digitally put everything back. Mm -hmm. right. uh, partly because of that and partly because of this, which is a stereo camera system which gives us 3D kind of mm -hmm. bubbles in which you can kind of crawl, and then you can see looking up to the sky and down below, but you can see it all 3D. A panorama. And you a can whole rotate panorama around. of everything. Uh, another kind of instrument. Oh, yeah, the Leica C10. It's a LiDAR uh, instrument. So LiDAR stands for Light uh, Detection and Ranging, but it's basically like a big laser scanner that can scan whole structures. <laughs> I mean, it could scan Mount Rushmore, or it could scan our our houses that we've excavated. Uh, maybe scan us. Uh, uh, can scan, that's yeah, they, yeah, yeah it's, that's possible. Um, and we scanned our whole site, uh, the excavated fields, with I think a, two, a centimeter accuracy, and in certain parts of it that were very important, down to two millimeter uh, precision. Right, right. So we could actually reconstruct these things mm -hmm. into that level of precision. Okay. And then what we did after the ladder was to uh, utilize this boom, this um, mm -hmm. tripod boom, and it would produce, when you sweep across and you're taking photos all the time, um, you can see some blank spots here and there with that mm -hmm. boom. And you also see some marks here that indicate um, reference points that are with the GPS unit identified. Mm -hmm. And these pictures then are stitched together and they're what we call geo-reference. So we know exactly to within the centimeter. Mm -hmm. uh, of where everything is in this picture. So what are we looking at in that uh, structure uh, there? That would be of interest. To we're, we're looking mention. at a building, um, and the main part of it is right here. It has a room here, a room here, a room here, and then one across here that's divided up a little bit, but it's a four-room house. But then it has extensions uh, on the sides, probably built about the same time, maybe for an expanded family, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Now. The new toy. Kent, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> this is a, well, a drone. This is a um, 3D robotics octocopter. So it has eight propellers. And we actually brought it to the studio today. And you can see it here on the table. Uh, this is some, well, it's a little bit ironic that we're using drones in the Middle East. Yeah, but we're using true. them for peaceful purposes, Peace, of course. Very peaceful purposes. Yes, but it's a LiPo a battery, so a very powerful battery. We can uh, run a flight for about 10 minutes and then we can swap out and put a fresh battery on. But we attach two cameras 
typically either in stereoscopic position, so side by side, and that's good for the 3D uh, video that we take, or in two separate positions for still pictures from which we do the photogrammetry or construct the three-dimensional plan of the site. What did people think when you brought that out to, uh, for the first time? <laughs> it, it would get a lot of stares, and people like to take pictures of it. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. while it's photographing, people would be uh -huh. turning their attention towards it. Did anybody worry about it, uh, uh, that uh, you were doing something that was illegal? No, nobody, like that? nobody uh -huh. was worried about it. Our uh -huh. department representatives, of course, were informed and were uh -huh. fine with it. The local um, uh, townspeople that we hired were just curious about it. Uh -huh. but, yeah, <laughs> Uh, they're um, certainly electronically more sophisticated than they used to be. So right. Well, and I took it in in my luggage. Um, uh -huh. so and, and no, no and problem. Nobody <laughs> asked any questions. They did about the batteries. Uh -huh. um, but we need those. The more sophisticated equipment, we need those. Now, this does uh, the, you do the 3D. You talked about the right. 3D, 3D video. video. And then even with the stills, you can create models that are 3D that you can then manipulate. Right. Uh, and then learn more about the layering. We call it the photogrammetry. So right. we're putting together a, uh, a diagram or a three-dimensional plan of mm -hmm. a structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, some results from this copter, octicopter. Um, here is our site. And the western side of the site is here. We've excavated most, we've done most of our excavation here. <coughs> the red areas show where we excavated this summer, and that's one of them. And then this is a new field. It's, a, it's called a step trench down the side of the tell mm -hmm. to try to find out something about, um, about defenses. And in the process of doing it, we now have, um, well, one can even see the leg of the octocopter here. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, I thought about cutting that out, but no, this is authentic, right. so I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> so now we can see the trenches that we cut and the extra probes that we put into uh, here for that purpose. And then we had, um, t tell us, uh, you have a few seconds here, Kent, to talk about what this picture represents. Well, every day we would, um, we would take pictures that we would use, again, for photogrammetry, um, documenting excavation in a square. And so this represents where the pictures were positioned, the camera positions. And this is all done on a, through a computer program. And then this is the, the three-dimensional plan that's reconstructed, and one can turn it around and look at it from any angle. So, and then one can actually peel every day's activity, because we did this That's every right. day. So then you can tell what you've done each day. We can re-excavate electronically. <laughs> we can do it again. If we were not happy the first time, we can keep doing it again. Thank you, Kent and Larry, and, and all of you for listening in for this particular edition of Excavating the Bible. We hope it's provided something for your minds and for your souls, and we look forward to next time. Until then, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For excavating the Bible.